monsters turn to ban. Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to Premier League presentation. We're going to be bringing you guys this game here between Alliance and Mouse Sports. These two teams have come on fighting through eight teams, down to four teams, and now down to these two in the grand finals of the Premier League Season 5 Super Cup. This is where it all, what it all comes down to. Alliance could take this away in a 3-0 sweep, given their one game advantage from the winner's bracket, but uh, Mouse Sports still having shown many times that they have the strategies and the skill level to compete very directly directly with Alliance might be able to take this away, but they would have to win three consecutive games. Either way, going on into it here, looks like it's going to be a fun little game, as was the last one. Thank you guys so much for tuning on in. I'm myself and Blaze, turning it over to Triumph of Man. Now here we go, Alliance decide they don't want to face the Batrider. Batrider has gone wish gone this time around, and Mouse Sports decide, well, we're not picking up Syllabair, so let's get rid of him. We already do have the Batrider banned out, so they don't need to spend their second band on that because, of course, they do generally go Wisp and Batrider as their bands. But this time around, they were the first pick. And Alliance, Alliance tend to enjoy that Roshan pit as part of their strategies, but this time, and they will actually have access to it. Mouse Sports, just for anybody wondering, Mouse Sports initially won the toss off and they took the Dire Side over first pick. They decided that was more important, and in the end, Mouse Sports. We ended up taking a fall anyway because Alliance read through their strategy and decided to bring them down because they had a nice idea. Like obviously, we see exactly how nasty Koykova's Tinker is and how much damage it could do. The problem was just did not get nearly as much time as he wanted to farm, and he got farm. Like he got time to farm, just not nearly enough. Alliance said, you know, they were under the clock, but they played to it just fine and just pushed and pushed and pushed and brought them down. Arguably a couple of uh, questionable engagements where Mouse Sports sort of overextended because they thought they could get a good setup with the Song of the Siren, but in the end, it ended up costing them a couple of racks there anyway. Final ban here for the first phase. Alliance, though, will take out the Nakes, get rid of the Lifestealer. Hmm. Interesting first pick of the Visage here. I mean, it's definitely a very powerful hero that has a lot of potential, not only in the tri-lane supporting mindset, but also when it comes down to making plays happen later stages of the game. But to pick it up first, it serves a very interesting set of priorities where they really, really want control of that hero and don't want to see Ake microing those birds. Yeah, of course, like, it takes Arky, the birds away from Arky. also gives them... I, I, I Honestly, I prefer to see Arky. Working with the, I feel like yeah, he's going to pick Chan. That's for, that's for yeah. sure. But I, yeah, I don't know. It's just right, interesting. I really like that, the same with the Chan. I, I'm just really interested why they decided the Visage was what they wanted to pick up. I understand the bans, banning out the Admiral Druid. Uh, uh, blah. Admiral B uh, Bulldog, <laughs> Lone Druid. You just you mix the names together. They might as well be the same person. But yeah, the Admiral D uh, Bulldog, Lone Druid. Of course, that's understandable. Ban out the Wisp. A very very unpredictably powerful hero in a lot of ways, in the Western scene especially. So I understand those two bands, but when it comes down to it, do you think Mouse Wars just really prefer to have pause on the Visage than anything else? Because obviously that means that they're giving away things like the Chen, uh, like really any hero that Alliance wants right now. I think they just want a solid pick. Like Visage is really flexible. The thing is that they select the Chen first, obviously keep it away from Arc and also Gang. The problem is that they sort of... they push themselves into a role, like they've got to have a jungler now. Mm -hmm. So they've got to work a strategy into that. But by opening up with the Visage, it's a solid support, it's got really strong, uh, and it's sort of, it can do okay towards the late game if you get some decent fire on him. And he can work offensive, defense, trans, so it's just an all around very, very solid pick. And has a lot of firepower to it. And again, it tends to be a fairly high priority Ooh. pick in the current meta. Alliance though, they will grab up an early Dragon Knight. Interesting choice. Now the question, will it be an S4 mid Dragon Knight? <laughs> Yeah, I I think, that's, I think that's almost guaranteed. Like the only way that Alliance has played Dragon Knight within the past month or two has been S4 playing it on the mid lane and uh, just using him as initiating disable. Now he still can go for some semi carry. He might go for a Lothars for some early gank, but generally speaking, it's all going to be all about getting him in position to get that Dragon Tail stun. Because you lock down a carry that's not magic immune with that kind of a duration stun, you're going to be able to blow them up very very quickly. Especially since Loda is probably going to be packing a punch with a high damage output carry rather than just a durability. One. Well, it looks like we're probably going to be seeing a Dragonite mid versus a Puck. I'm going to give Fat out. Like, Fat is going to be mm. getting his hands in his Puck, and of course, he plays a very mean Puck. However, this is going to be pr a pretty easy mid lane for him because honestly, Dragonite not really the best mid at all. And he's like viability, in all honesty, his viability has been severely hurt by the fact you can't bottle Crow nearly as hard as you used to. And that really was essential for keeping him in that mid lane. You can, yeah, you've got Dragon's Blood, but if you pick up Dragon's Blood, you sacrifice, like, early levels of Dragon's Blood, you sacrifice levels of Flame Breath, and obviously you want Flame Breath to help your CS as well, so it's not great. And with Puck, 
the range hero like you can harass him pretty hard he's got double nukes he's got the auto attack from his distance even if you've got the ex starting level and dragons but it's not that good at holding him in the lane so I think Puck is going to have a fairly easy option if this is indeed a solo mid dragon knight he will have a lot of opportunity to get out of control quickly and of course the other thing is Puck can go and do stuff a lot earlier than Dragon Knight as well. So, I mean, we're talking about these high impact mids. Puck is that kind of hero. Dragon Knight needs to find a Lothars, needs to find farm, needs to find levels. Puck just needs level 6 and he can go off and do stuff. If he gets a Blink Dagger, it's gravy, but he can still, he's a really big threat. Especially if you've got under level supports who've been tri laning. And they grab up a Weaver. I like it. Um, in, in this situation, I, like I was saying, they need a high damage output support, uh, carry. And so they will be able to right-click hard with that. It does change up the lanes a little, a little bit because they might be... Uh, I mean, they can still play like a defensive trial and weaver. It's just it's not really where you see the hero. You usually see him in an aggressive trial and you sometimes see him like Tame My Wild loves to run him solo mid. So there are there's an, a bit of unpredictability to it. Uh, I personally haven't seen Lotus Weaver, but he has so many different carries in his repertoire. I'm sure he can play that up uh, plenty of times over if he hasn't already. But as far as how it plays itself out uh, the big thing here is that they have a lot of physical damage and still some durable heroes hand of god uh, not, doesn't guarantee but it certainly contributes to the potential of getting time lapse off successfully because you're going to be able to sustain through it so i think it'll, it'll work out nicely uh the question is who are they going to support it with since of course they only have the chin on the field uh, are they going to look for a maybe a nyx to work along uh, against the root of the keeper light i'm not too sure but we'll have to see I'll be honest, I would rather see them mix things up and run the Weaver mid. I feel like it's definitely a better choice mm -hmm. because it's gonna it's gonna hold its own a lot better against Puck. Plus it also has the op like it has the option to actually deal a lot of damage Ooh. against okay, well this is yeah. this is definitely a different story now. This is definitely a different story, although obviously it would give Dragonite a lot of breathing room with the train protector in the mid, however, if you put Weaver in mid and now he gets stupidly aggressive, you've got Tramp. Like, he can get ridiculously aggressive with the living armor. So, I actually, I still, I stand by that. I would rather see the Weaver take mid just because he can get so aggressive and really, really put some punishment on Puck. I think there's going to be... Just uh, yeah, I mean, I understand definitely it has a lot of potential to go back and forth there. The phase shift, can, I mean, can avoid some auto attacks and things like that. And Weaver can still, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. But I really think there's just going to be an, uh, simply an Emerald Bulldog. Weaver, who's going to try to survive as best he can, so the Tree and Protector can keep him sustained on the lane, and uh, that would be a lane that you generally have to abandon, because you're going up against a Phantom Lance or a Keep a Light and a Visage. It's a very powerful tri-lane, but with the Shikuchi in conjunction with the Living Armor, it's viable to actually survive on through that as an offlane hero. Actually, that's, yeah, that's definitely a good point. He is, he is going to be fairly durable. However, of course, they do have some really big hard-hitting nukes still. I mean, Illuminate's are always going to hurt. And the fact that this spam can also come out really, really hard. I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm just wondering, I, you've got a Phantom Lancer, you've got to keep it alive. The thing is, they could go offensive with that setup if they wanted to. If Mouse Sports feel like it, I think it's unlikely because they tend to like to just say, yeah, just sit them back. Although, we could actually see Koikova. They could actually throw Koikova on the Phantom Lancer and throw that as an offensive lane because even with the Tram Protector, there, you've got Weaver, Chen. Chen's going to sit in the jungle for a bit. That's really difficult for Weaver to find any room to farm, mm -hmm. especially if they go up there with an early set of wards. Yeah. So it really depends on that last pick, but I think they could really mess up their plans, Alliance's plans, if they do do that. But it comes down to how they want to lane this more than anything else and who's playing, like which player is playing what hero. Mm -hmm. I would definitely wager that Black's going to be picking up the Phantom Lancer. He, like you said, might be running the so a solo bottom Phantom Lancer. But, uh, they, and then they could exploit the weakness of Triant in the lane and uh, put him aggression out on top lane. But I definitely think that if you're going to have a, a carry that scales so darn well, you're going to be having Black play just to get as much CS as possible, even if it does mean he has to go 1v1 versus a Weaver or something along those lines. Uh, right now, the whole plan of Alliance is to shake up the laning phase, uh, because again, they have a lot of room to make things work. They have three games consecutively that they just have to not lose. So in this situation, what they're going to try to do is throw the landing phase off a little bit here. Again, the DK can roam a, a little bit. He can definitely move on about, uh, but most importantly, he can benefit a ton from a gank coming in from other lanes. If Chen roams in with a smoke, gets a net on a puck or something like that, you can get a pretty well set up Dragon Tail, and that can be very, very special. So uh, along with that, they're forcing Mouse Sports out of their comfort zone, and they're changing things up, which I don't think Mouse is r exactly prepared for. Now waiting four seconds for their last ban. Reserve time down to four. They ban out the Naga Siren. 
I'd be kind of surprised if they went for the Naga Siren because the problem is, sure, they've got Song, they've got Overgrowth, and now where's their damage? And you've got these two huge teamfight holds that don't actually deal any damage, so that would be questionable. And there we go. The last hero that in Bulldog's repertoire there, arguably. Clockwork's out, Tree uh, Prophet's out. Actually, well, actually, no, Darks is still there. I could have picked him Darks as well, so they pick up Bounty Hunter as well. <laughs> but yeah, Bounty Hunter, I really feel like this isn't like this this screams they want to do something aggressive they want to get ganked they want to really start ganking mm -hmm. really really hard because you're getting out of control there with the bounty hunter with the track girl that can really do some nasty stuff i am definitely i will be quite worried though because mouse sports if they wanted to i mean they could go aggressive with the phantom lancer and just pick black say jarakov oh actually no jarakov is banned and image out as well uh, i guess not then the lifesteal i mean there's three heroes for black lifesteal and anti-mage and they're going to pick up storm spirit yeah, no, I can see that too, but it will be possibly an offensive. I've seen this before where they go like with the Storm Spirit in the tri lane. Yeah, unless they're planning to do another hero swap because we saw Mouse Sports do that earlier, where it was looking like a really weird setup, and they just swap heroes after the after the picking screen. No, I think what we're gonna do is so we're gonna see. Uh, of course, we do see Loda on the Weaver, so that, because Admiral Bulldog was able to pick up the Bounty Hunter, he doesn't get to pick it up as much in competitive because he doesn't feel comfortable with it. But in matchmaking, it's pretty much his favorite hero. It's like his third most played hero, and he just goes to town on it. But in this situation, I actually do think it's gonna be a Triland Storm benefiting a ton from the Chakra Magic. So this is gonna be uh, pretty much based on Visage and Storm Spirit getting the, com the Sable combos off getting the Grave Chills and the Electric Vork Texas off to make it work. Um, this will give Black plenty of room to farm, because beyond 1v1 Contestation, he, there's not really going to be much opportunity to roam. But if Ake gets some good creeps, I can still see this falling apart, because the, the gank potential is just so strong uh, with that coming in from the jungle. But to start things off, we're going to see the lineups uh, come on through. To start things off, we do have S4 going to be the mid lane Dragonite, starting off with three branches and three tangos. We do have Loda going to be carrying it up on the Weaver here, looking for a Bassy early on. Then we do also have Admiral Bulldog. He's going to be offlaning Poor Man's Shield first with some regen pooled. Going to be going right now towards the mid lane, but I presume making his way down bottom. That's going to be a supportive EGM Tramp Protector, and also, as I mentioned, Ake on his chin. You want to go over mouse sports real quick? Yeah, mouse sports. We've got Cinderin playing Keep It Light. Fado going to be playing Puck. Koikva uh, playing the Storm Spirit, Pass on the Visage, and Black on the Phantom Lancer. Phantom Lancer has actually been sent top with Black. This is something they actually used to do they, when they picked the Life Stealer for the Offensive Tron. They'd still put Black on it instead of putting Koikva on it, and they would still run the Offensive Tron with Black in it rather than just leaving him in the safe land to farm. So they're going to be going with that role. And this is going to give... I, I don't mind this as well because Storm Spirit is going to do quite well against the Bounty Hunter. It's going to make it very hard for Bulldog to see us effectively. Obviously... The Phantom Lancer is going to do f decently against the Bounty Hunter as well. However, this mm -hmm. is just going to allow Storm Spirit. Like Storm Spirit is going to just shut down the Bounty Hunter, hopefully. Sure. So Yeah, that was essentially the choice they had to make. Did they want to prioritize uh, the farming of Black 100%, or did they want to make sure that Storm Spirit would get good experience for Renna? And I think it's wise, since they did go ahead and pick up a such an experience reliant hero as Storm Spirit, who can do so much with level 6, that they went ahead and got that for themselves. Looks like Loda will be able to pick up a double damage, though, and uh, currently roaming about bot lane. Uh, that means that these lanes are quite a bit skewed. We see currently Admiral Bulldog is going to be essentially solo suicide in his own safe lane because of the tri lane that he's going 1v3 against. So I really love this movement from Alliance. It shakes things up, and that's what this draft is all about. Unpredictability with the fact that Weaver, DK, Bounty Hunter, they can all go so many different places. But now Koikova, solo safe lane against a Weaver with living armor double damage. Very tough to deal with indeed. I think we'll probably just see that a quick rotation here from Mouse Sports. They'll just move their supports down towards and help out. But as soon as, you, as soon as they realize exactly what's going on over here, they'll go, all right, well, you know what? We don't actually need all three heroes up here doing achieving absolutely nothing. And on the other hand, this isn't... Like, the rotation that they would be making there isn't a bad result for them. Like, that'd be fine. Because the thing is, if they go down here, bring the supports down here to back a coin, even if they don't rotate the primary farmers, just the supports, it means the supports are now next to their own jungle, so they can always farm that up themselves. However, it looks like they're not going for that just yet. They're moving Cinderin over there. However, they're keeping Pass up in the top. I'm a bit of a dive down here. It looks like we've got Loda going in deep. However, now moving further. This is Aki now in a bad position. He's getting oh. hit by the Static Remnant as well. No, it doesn't quite get hit by it, but it will give away the first blood anyway. And now Loda is stuck on the wrong side of town here. He's actually going to chew his way free. We'll manage to wind walk his way out, or maybe not. Just getting free there. Yeah. That attack missing because of the invisibility. Two attacks, dodging a tower attack and the overload shot there from the Storm Spirit as well. 
Yeah, the big issue there was the Hellbear Smasher wasn't taking the tower. It was Ake himself that delivered the right click to engage the tower's attention. And with that, he was just taking way too much damage considering that position. And that went very sour for them very, very quickly. So now they might, they're not going to change up the strategy. They still want to go for the offensive jungle Chen. But they are this time around going up against the Keeper Light and a rather experienced Storm Spirit considering the first blood. Yeah, there we go. Aki, though, rotating back down here again. He's just going to try and grab... He's got a Centaur available, or he could even go for a Wildkin if he wanted to. Of course, the Wildkin, having access to the Tornado, is a really, really big pain to deal with when you're trying to lane against it. CS-wise, loaded, you know, 6 and 1 for the moment. Storm, like, at the very least, I mean, this is impacting Storm Spirit's ability to farm, and he has burned through all of his regen, too. He's sitting on nothing there right now, so harassment is going to become a big issue, whereas Loader can quite happily run through his regen because he's got tree right behind him. He's only got one tango left. Now, S4, though, has managed to bottle a rune there. He's got an invis. It looks like Fata might be planning to send the bottle back on the courier in a second. He's been spamming the illusory orbs pretty hard here against S4. And he is starting to get ahead on the CS as well. I'm just wondering whether they're going to rotate. Or if the, even uh -oh. if they are going to rotate pass, I think they might just be doing this. Because they're going to get a... Yep. Real quick, this courier has an empty bottle on it and is going to try to give uh, Storm Spirit his boots. This is going to be really bad. The pings start coming out. They realize what mistake they're making. And they're going to be able to keep it alive. They do try to haste it on south. But that going through that mess of individuals, especially with Weaver's Geminate to be taken in, under consideration, that was actually a pretty dangerous move. But they luckily did uh, rectify the circumstances before it did punish them. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. In this landing situation, who do you think is winning out? Well, Chen, if they can put some punishment, like, Chen is playing with fire here. Like, he's in the middle of all these heroes that could come and really hurt him. Like, Puck is level 5. Puck could put some serious hurt on Chen if he decides to rotate. He's going to wait for level 6, but he's going to be in a bad situation. You've got Cinderin down here as well, the nice big nuke. So, for the moment, Chen's doing okay, but as soon as he gets forced out of this jungle, I think we're going to find that mouse sports are going to start getting ahead on experience. The other problem here, of course... Oh, but is, 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 see? Whoa, he just took so long to react up on top lane. He was just standing there for a full two seconds. I don't think he's disconnecting. It's just he literally didn't respond to the situation. That was a full HP bulldog right underneath his feet, bringing him down very quickly. Unfortunately, Black and I really have to do a whole lot. How they jump in from behind and clean up Park. Fatter gets taken down there as well. Courtesy of Dragonite and Chen rotating for the gank there. So Chen, he plays a risky move, like running running around the enemy jungle. Offensively jungling with Chen is a really, really risky move. However, it pays off here, getting them a much-needed kill on Puck. I think he probably got caught out of position by the Dragon Tail. That stun mm -hmm. is so damn big. As, yeah, look look at this. He's being so aggressive with the Illusory Orbs. This is probably what caught him out here. He moves in, throws down the Waning Rift, and now there we go, Dragon Tail. Dragon Form as well. Harpy coming in from behind. Oh. He's probably going to get taken out here. Oh, no. There we go. He will manage to Ethereal Hero Jaws Harpy. Out. He might get the next one. This range is insane. Chain Lightning is going to come out in a second. He stops the bottle, but he doesn't pursue. Ake okay. leaves the Harpy to move to the side and will not be able to bring down Fata. Though that bottle is pretty strong and, will, of course, is going to keep him alive long enough anyways. But still, you look at Dragonite, you're thinking, okay, well, S4 taking way too much harassment. He was dropped down below half health, but this Living Armor coming into play, it is rank 2, and EGM using it for every money, every piece of mana it's worth. Indeed, indeed. Now we've got Loader though. Loader's starting to get ahead on the farm here. He is definitely ahead of the Storm Spirit by a couple. And it just comes down to the fact he can be so aggressive here. He's just nothing to fear at all. Storm Spirit though has finished up his tread, so he's a little bit tankier. And looks like he's going to force Loader back for the moment. We'll need another shot of that healing armor in a sec. The living armor in a moment. And of course, the thing that we can't take it all, the thing we can't discount, of course, is the fact that Black is farming away quite well. But, on the other hand, Bounty Hunter, Admiral Bulldog's off to a good start. Mm -hmm. Don't usually see his Bounty Hunter get off to this kind of start. He is leading the CS chart at the moment, normally getting stuck in that off lane, and not really finding a whole lot to farm at all. Yeah. Admiral Bulldog actually really, or actually, sorry, Bounty Hunter really, really thrives in a one versus one matchup with his high base armor and his good HP regen with the living armor. He's actually able to trade hits extremely effectively. And then when the Janata is off cooldown, it's just that much more incentive to actually go hard on somebody, get a couple extra right clicks. Didn't go for an Orb of Venom or anything like that, but still able to not necessarily zone the Phantom Lancer, but guarantee that he's going to get. Uh, offensive CS after offensive CS, so that's why he's sitting at 30 and 5, and he's going to be able to get some much more effective items uh, to actually make things work. Maybe a drum of tree or drum of endurance to start things off. I mean, that's the joy of tree with the distribution of tree out, like living armor. In you pretty much can win your one v ones very easily, and that's well, literally what he decided. It's what he brings to the table as a hero. But this is it, though. Like we've got the bounty hunter. 
Admiral Bulldog's getting ahead in the Bounty Hunter. Obviously, Weaver's off to some decent stuff. But the problem, I, the thing that worries me here for Alliance is the fact that Mouse Sports has two high-impact heroes that are getting a good start, like a decent start. Obviously, Puck's died once, but he's got 31 CS six minutes in, so he's off to a pretty decent start, and he doesn't need that much to get rolling. And, you know, 20 minutes, like we saw earlier when the Storm Spirit, like 20 minute mark, it's when the Storm Spirit really starts to get scary, where you can really start having a massive impact. And you combine that, he's got a puck on the same team. These two heroes are super mobile, can jump all over your team and tear it to shreds. Granted, you've got a Chen, but if they jump on top of the Chen, suddenly you've lost a lot of your survivability. So that, I am a little bit worried for Alliance there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if they can buy enough time in the mid game, the late game in Alliance oh, arguably shoot. is a lot better as the bottom lane, we get a kill down there. Yeah, actually, I completely missed that one, unfortunately, but they had good movement there. They were able to initiate with Puck, and when they got the double Dream Coil, that was pretty much all she wrote on that one. Uh, the Weaver does not have time lapse up and available, and they did have Sentry Wars if they needed them. As well. What's that? It was, a four, it was a 4v2 yeah. down there, and Tree Tree doesn't really, like, obviously, he's got League Armor, but it's not maxed out, so everybody hits you once and it's all gone. And this is it, like, you've got S4 who's getting a good start here as well, 34 and 7, and he's helped pick up a kill against Puck, but the problem is, it's Dragonite, like, he needs to get items done, so he's not going to have that same ability to just suddenly get totally out of control and just control the game. On the plus side, he's got a lot better push power, like, you see here, he's doing, like, the second Puck left him alone with his tower, he's put so much damage into it with the Dragon form. So that is definitely a positive for them, but we can see Luzri Orb come out. Puck doesn't have Dream Call, though, it is on cooldown being used to kill the bottom lane, so they won't be able to make a crack at Dragonite just yet. Yep. So, the, the way things are looking right now, Bulldog is going to be able to do some really, really ganking, uh, effective ganking plays. He's going to be able to move around with track, and since the Defusal Blade is not going to be here anytime soon, they can get some good kills on Phantom Lancer without even having to waste invisibility detection items, and so that can be very, very effective. But as a whole, they need to kind of get their focus to at least bring down these supports a couple times over, because underleveled supports versus Bounty Hunter and Weaver is going to be pretty easy food to just continuously just jump all over, but first it's up on top. They were able to get a Janata, a max roll test of faith, as well as that shockwave to go across from the Seder. So, Nikolikova tries to get a little bit of revenge onto Ake, but Living Armor stops that in his tracks. And yeah, although the, I understand the Storm Spirit pick was pretty good if they were going 1v1 versus Bounty Hunter, uh, the one thing to consider is the fact that Living Armor is one of the, be the best counters in the game next to Storm Spirit. Like, people pick up a Doombringer against Storm Spirit, I pick up a Trion. It's just every single time he initiates on somebody, he has only so much damage he can give and on only so much mana he has at his disposal. And in this mid-game state, where he relies on kills to be as effective as possible, it's Living Armor will, gen generally speaking, counteract almost all that he brings. You see Punk, though, starting to to rank up in levels. He really needs to hit that level 10 level, and once he gets to the level 11, he's really going to be quite lethal, because he opted to go with an Illusory Hall build, didn't want to get too close for the waning, uh, for the waning Rifts against the Dragonite, obviously a risky move considering Dragon Tail. So this will limit his ability against Weaver, because he does need that max level silence to really help him burst down Weaver before he can just time-lapse or Shikuchi out of trouble. So we'll need to get that up and running before he's a serious threat to him. And of course, you've got, you've got the Living Armor, and uh-oh, Black's been found in the jungle. He will manage to just run away, though, with Double Walk before he gets caught out there. Last reaction was him. Dragonite decided not to bother with this stun, which, fair enough, he probably wasn't going to land a kill solo anyway. But we've got to keep in mind, not only do we have Living Armor for Alliance, we do also have Hand of God in a moment once Chen finishes hitting that level 6. He isn't quite there, though. That early death did slow him down a little bit, and he has been sort of rolling around looking for ganks rather than just purely focusing on his farm. He, you know, Aki is like a Chen player, tends to be a lot more aggressive. He, likes to, he doesn't just sit down and go, I need a mech right now. He says, all right, let's go and help. Let's go and gank. Let's put pressure down. Bottom lane, though, this is what Dragonite's good for. The pushing power, the corrosive breath, going to do some serious damage to tower. Probably actually going to take it down as well. Now, Pass is here, but they definitely need Puck or Storms for it to, blink, uh, to teleport in here to help him out. In fact, it's going to let it go. They're going to try and trade for the mid tower. Unfortunately, Glyph's going to come out. It's not going to happen. No. Black is spending a lot of mana, though, on his, uh, this is the second time recently that he's popped a rank 1 doppelwalk, and he's just not able to farm as effectively as he would like to. Right now, he was kind of matching Bounty Hunter 30 for 30 earlier, and now he's fallen where he's only got 44 several minutes later. So it's really gone to show that the Bounty Hunter is kind of forced him out of the lane, and that means that Bounty Hunter can start rotating around. He has nobody to kill up top, goes ahead and kills down on bottom, pause, about to get locked down, and uh, that last right click is going to do it. Quite a range for that melee right click, but... Either way, that movement speed, phase and drum, and the track increase is always going to allow him to stay on target. So, very nicely done. First track kill, as far as I can tell, and uh, is going to allow them to keep it going. Going, moving around towards the mid lane here, where there is no tier 1 tower. Going in behind enemy lines. Are they going to be able to get that dragon tail off? Yes, they are, and that is going to be a kill again on the Phantom Lancer. Killing spree for Bulldog. 
this is gonna start getting bloody. Yes, this is like where Alliance's lineup excels. They've taken the tier ones in the mid and the bottom. Like this really makes them quite vulnerable. These squishy heroes, you've got Phantom Lance, you've got the supports who really cannot afford. Like, see what Sindarin is right now? He's so vulnerable. In fact, Bulldog's going to take a crack at him. He's got the Weaver coming in with a track as well. And I think Sindarin realizes he's actually in a lot of trouble here. In fact, track, if it's going to go down, there it is. Shuriken oh. tosses out, gets a kill, solos it up. And he will walk away with another track kill there. And this is like every time the supports step out to try and do some bit of farming, try and use the jungle, this is where Alliance are going to punish them. Even even the non support like Vandalizer, he's again really, really susceptible to these ganks. And it's going to come down, I feel, to like mouse bots using the Storm Spirit, using the pup to put pressure and dissuading these attempts. And I think they're actually going to wait for the first core items on the Storm Spirit and the puck before they go for this. Puck doesn't quite have his uh, needs his blink. I think he wants his blink before he gets active. Storm Spirit also has still work, he's still looking towards an Orchid, and I think he wants to finish that first. He's actually going to dive on top of S4, cops a Dragon Tower to the face for his troubles. We're going to have the Illuminate come through here, jumps forward again, Aki now, King's dead Aki. As it looks like they're also going to probably S4 as well. Oh no, Dragon, oh the Living Armor, plus the high, oh, high durability, the Dragon form. With Dragon's Blood, not enough though in the end. The 4v2 again proves to be too strong. Indeed. And, I mean, they just, they'd really, in that situation, they were pl pushing aggressively because they wanted this tower really, really badly. They have a great pushing lineup, but the problem is they have great pushing lineup on two heroes, not five. And so they have different, uh, different intentions. Bulldog well, wants to gank, the everybody else wants to push. And as we see, he picked off Cinderin, but he shouldn't be able to get Puck as a result of uh, the phase shift. But here is Loda coming in for a great flank. The swarm comes out. He has one more phase shift coming in a moment, but that's all he's got going for him. And Bulldog gets another Janata in just a moment to finish the job. But Koikova gets the electric vortex, the hand of God to keep him up. They finish the job on the puck, but Bulldog gets away with the disjoint of the tower auto attack. That was so close. And now they're going to pop off the overgrowth. Koikova expending all his mana to get as far away as possible, but the track comes out and the right click to finish the job. That's a ton of cash going the way of Alliance. And I think that might even get the tower. It was pretty low before. Loaded, throwing in a couple Geminates should do the trick here. Indeed. Looks like the... Oh, actually, no, he's backing up. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit worried, of course. The birds are flying around there. Uh, it looks like Dragon Knight is working towards his Lothar. And this is just going to get really brutal for Mouse. In fact, they're losing these Tier 1s. Like, this Tier 1 should go with the next crack at it up in the top lane. So this is just all the Tier 1s down. This is really limiting their option to farm. Because you're dealing with three invisible heroes once Dragon Knight picks up that Lothar uh, picks up the Shadow Blade there. And of course, I suppose technically Trent has invisibility as well if he bothers to skill it, but not generally what you think of. Nature's Guys has a lot not of great. limitations, to be honest. Not There's, great. Stats are pretty strong, comparatively speaking. But, um, you know, the Lothars will still allow you to get in for that Dragon Tail, guaranteed. Right now, at 2.5 seconds, he will start maxing that pretty soon since he has hit 11. Um, but ganks coming on through not really too much hope to bring him down considering how durable this guy can be and in fact might turn around popping off the phase boots shadow walk closing the distance black is in a hell of a lot of trouble gonna get the track off before the top wall comes on through and that means s4 is gonna clean him up it's nicely done koikova probably just gonna janata and tract but uh i don't think they can bring him down considering his positioning and mana yeah, unless he's silly enough to come forward and get hit by a dragon tail he's probably gonna get away from this scot free Got to say, unfortunate oh. for Black, he popped the Tranquil Boots, which gave him away. They knew exactly which one to go after. So looks like they're going to come forward. Dragon Tail, this is what I mean. You run for, why would you run a Dragon Tail there? It's going to cause them some serious grief. Dragon Form, get pushed back with the Blinding Light there, but they will pick off. Pass, he goes down there, and then they're going to go for another track. Oh no, no, Quirk, he's out of mana. He will zip away just after popping the Magic Wand. Cleaned up, though, they will take the Bounty Hunter, but it's one of those heroes who could suicide and get away. Laughing as they're going to go for the Bird Goal as well. Two wow. sets of Bird Goal given away, and they lose Cinder and Feeder and giving away a kill there. Port coming in, they're probably going to get the Tower anyway. Tower is going to go down. He's fact, waiting. He was hoping, He's he was like... hoping that he finished the port. <sighs> oh, wow. S4 going to town. Lance have begun to follow across the map. Going to go and find... Uh, oh, back over towards the base. DK is going to get hit by that one there. They're actually going to be looking at Roshan right here. They do start off dropping a Sunshu Ward down just in case there is a little bit of smoke movement. They can have one person watching the camera in this general area and keep good coverage of what's going on because they do have both Observer and Sentry Ward. So smokes won't be an option coming in from that vector. And so they're going to try to tank it up. They do have Leech Seed if they can break the Lincolns, but more likely just going to rely on that Living Armor and Medallion. Yeah, it should do the trick there. And of course, Alliance, they love taking the early Roshans. They will snag this one around the 17 minute mark. Smoke up, though, from Mouse Sports. I don't really think they, they could potentially, if they can get in there with the Dream Coil, 
If they get on top of this with a drink call, they could try and make something happen. However, they are too far away, and Roshan finished up very easily there for Alliance. And also, Weaver, I think he might have finished up the Lincolns. Yes, he... Oh, actually, no, that's a mech recipe. Nope. Never mind. Close. But no cigar just but, yet. Hmm. There we go. Weaver actually going to dive in on top of Fatter here. Fatter decides to phase shift out. Also pops the invisibility as well. Weaver just going to use the opportunity to do a little bit of de-warding. I really feel like this game, this game is definitely starting to slide away here. It's over a 5k gold lead now for Alliance. Working way towards a 6. We've got a smoke up from Aki here. Looks like we're going to have a clash here in the jungle. You're going to dive in on top of them. Stormspirit jumps in there, gets the electric 14. So Hand of God comes out there. Koikva about to go down. No, zips forward again. He's still in the mix, but we lose pass. The Dream Call is there, locking Loader and S4 down. They're not going to pursue. BKB activated by Bulldog. They're still giving chase to the Stormspirit. Senorita Q, as Beat has told me to call him, will go down to a Shuriken Toss. He was out of mana, could no longer zip away. Yeah. That's two heroes down, and I think mo I think the pair of them were track kills too. At the very least, the storm yeah. kill was definitely a track kill. Yeah, they both were. So, getting so much cash flow, this is just going to be a huge advantage. I don't want to say it's insurmountable because I do have a PL, but at this state, they just have so much going for them. Not only do they have Shadow Blade up on DK, but he's twenty one hundred in the bank. Gonna start pushing, putting pressure on the tier three. And honestly, like any right click, the familiars are near. They're just gonna get cleaved on. Looks like backdoor protection is up, but they could care less. Diving the base, Cinder and gets stunned on up. Loda gets stunned on out from the familiar. So they're not gonna be able to finish the job here. Instead, just focusing on the tower now. The creep wave has arrived. Cinder and healing on up. Just going for one more illuminate before heading back to the fountain. Now tier three dropping quickly. Corrosive still at work despite his ultimate having expired. But that is all they're gonna take here. They're gonna fall back. This is bro it's so hard to fight them right now because their experience, like the experience deficit is huge. Alliance have a 10,000 plus experience lead. And this is where it's really, really hurting. They also have picked up a 10,000 gold lead as well on top of this. The track gold just coming out all over the show. Park, that's half his health in one Janata hit. My God, that is so painful. Dragon's Breath comes through. Another track kill as Puck hits the dirt. And now Pass trying to throw out a soul stuff, doing practically nothing. A heal up there, so we're going to see Storm Spirit get, oh, get netted up. We'll jump back. They're tracked up as well. They're still working their way through. In fact, look at this regrowth there. Or re uh, the healing there on the barracks there. It looks like they're just going to back up there. The overgrowth doesn't do a whole lot. It looks like they will lose. A buy well, they will lose fin the Syndrome once again. And a buyback there from Phantom Lancer. So you don't see the stun go down. Oh no, it's Storm Spirit again. The crit comes out. Down he goes. Dragon Tail is just so powerful. It's only level two at the moment. They've got the Shadow Blade. Just gives the option just to charge in there. And they don't. Oh well, they do actually have a counter ward down in the mid lane. Yeah. But once they get towards here, I mean, they can just go in this and just charge towards them. The chain of events there started off by Fada getting picked off ne next to his racks. I'm really not sure how they closed the distance so effectively when they had that sentry. Uh, they had creeps, had just spawned, they had the vision, but he didn't get the orb phase shift off in time. And uh, he had the blink dagger too. Like, all this points to Fada, with his general puck repertoire, should have been able to respond to that situation a little better. But instead, he got picked off despite the sentry ward. And from I'm there, there's no real going back. I... I think he just got like he just got caught out. He wasn't expecting the sheer amount of damage that Bounty Hunter put. Like Bounty Hunter did half his health in one hit, mm -hmm. just like one crit hit. That was all he did. And obviously, you know, he got hit by the crit. He might have not been that worried about him. And also, obviously, there was a mess of creep like just coming right, right up there. He might just not have physically seen the Bounty Hunter in the mess. Like even with the ward up, obviously, he's still sort of semi, semi invisible to the eye. Might just not have noticed him, and he might have really, you know, trying to be keeping an eye out for the Dragon Knight. But as it is, he opened that up, and just Flame Breath, the crit, the Flame Breath just went down so quickly, it wasn't funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the result of that pickoff is a lot of damage for Mouse Sports. The, da the damage report we're looking at, of course, the melee racks, the, the tier 3 goes already down, but the melee racks, a number of deaths, and a two forced buybacks. One from Storm Spirit, one from Cinderin, delaying that mechanism once again. I mean, that would be his mechanism right now if he didn't have to buy back, but he's still waiting it out. And uh, that means their team fight is that le much less effective, unfortunately. And now they do get a jump into your side. I think this is really good if they want to start going on the offensive. But so far, Alliance have won every single one of these exchanges, and they still have this Agency Mortal up on Loda. Well, no, they, they need the jam because with the well, with uh, that, all they need like an absolute crap, like a huge network of counter mm -hmm. Because if Dragonite gets a stun off on Puck, he is going down so fast. 3.25 seconds stun once he gets that maxed out. I mean, it's level 3. It's almost level... Actually, he's actually delayed that by a level. He's picked up an early level in stats. Come to think of it. Yeah, he's got an extra level in stats there. Obviously, level 16, he's going to get his third level ult. Just the slow from that is absolutely amazing. 
But as it is, like he needs this because he gets stunned. If he gets stunned by Dragon Tails, just lights out. He's so easy to pick up. But even if Bounty Hunter isn't even close, just a sheer oh, damage to Dragonite right now. Max Flame Breath, he's going to pick him off. And to Lane, we lose Phantom Lancer mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, just farming too it's far just, out. It's so hard. Well, yeah, it's just it's just got no, this invisible gank team. There's just nowhere for him to farm at all. Like they've just got it. He's got to just sit in the base, even in his base because they don't have detection here. Is legitimate, like not a legitimate place to farm. Just because like the aggressive nature in which Bounty Hunter is playing. Bounty Hunter is just pushing forward. It's like, look, he's, he wants Sinner. He, he says, that's food over there. I want that. The thing about S4, though, reveals himself. Waits a little bit too long. I'm just going to press forwards there. And there we go. Third level. Third level in his ult, too. He's got the Frost Dragon. Hasn't brought it out just yet. Of course, it does have a very long cooldown. For right now, the gold graph has plateaued a little bit. Same with experience, but if S4, if Otto gets cleaned up, no, he gets a waiting rift off. He won't get stunned. Instead, turning around onto S4, the hand of God does come out, so he will stay up a little bit longer. Popping off the dragon form, though, he is going to get dropped down. So he is in the grave for quite some time. EGM's overgrowth just a little bit off point, unfortunately. But Black on the run, they have detection. But uh, they, yeah, the leech seed will be enough to bring him down. So cleaning it up, they did lose DK, but they got three others. As far as buybacks go, Radiant has one visage, and he's not going to expend it here so, with the 15 seconds remaining. So tier three push in the mid lane is what they're looking at. Any one of these guys can tank it up. Afata doing some harassment for he orbs on out. Same thing with Poikova. Actually going to finish off Ake right here, looking for more, but it's going to be very very difficult to actually get a pick. Instead, the track comes out, just trying to bait them further into the base as best he can, but they're just going to fall back from here, and Koikova's zipping, even with the Chakra Magic, won't be enough to actually close the distance. Fod as well, though, almost about to finish off EGM. He does have his Nature's Guys, and is going to pop that and heal on up from a little bit of Leech Seed before TPing on out of there. S4 went for the S and Y, though. I feel like he should have probably done the big KB first, just because it would pretty much make him immune to Puck's initiate. Like Puck initiates, tries to jump, and he just immediately throws the BKB down and laughs it off. So I think that would have been a safer bet. The S and Y though, Dragonite, you can use utilize all those stats. So it's still a decent pick for him, but I just feel I'm not sure mm -hmm. that's a really serious pickup at this stage of the game. He can pick up anything he wants as long as it has strength on it. It's it's actually pretty common. Like uh, S and Y for Dragonite, not uncommon at all. Yeah. It's it's yeah, I mean, it's a solid choice for him. He needs all the stats. He needs movement speed. Needs mobility. Needs the attack. Needs the strength. Even the slow. The slow is the only thing that he doesn't really give a crap about. Obviously, the extra damage from the main is nice, but still, obviously, he gets the. Frost breath, so the slow isn't a big deal, but for the most part, it's a solid pick. But in this case, just because they have Puck and the ability to laugh off his initiation, I feel the BKB would have been a stronger choice. But as it is, he's building it right now anyway. Yep. So coming on in, S4 is detected up by this Gemma's Root site. They go ahead and Dream Call it up. They're going to be able to pick him off, possibly, but he's so darn tanky. And now Fada is getting a lot of damage pressure in from the Bulldog, critting up on Cinderin. But S4 is going to be the one to drop down first. Now in pursuit of the Bounty Hunter, he heads for the hills. Uh, but out of drum charges, they're not going to pursue. Um, yeah, as far as that goes, I mean, I absolutely agree. But you can pretty much say this anytime Sanjin Yas is picked up in a game like this with such an advantage. There's... There are great positives for a hero like Dragonite. Mobility is great to get in for Dragon Tail, but to debate whether or not it's the strongest possible pickup, generally speaking, it's not. But it's not the end of the world because they have such an advantage right here. They would have to be playing some very interesting Dota if they're going to be able to throw this one away. Yeah, I feel the the BKB without a doubt was the better choice because I mean you look at the difference here. Bounty Hunter just walked away from that with his BKB up and laughed it off, whereas Dragonite he would have ignored all of that, practically all of that damage if he just had the BKB done. But Either bottom way. lane now, we're going to have a push here. They're going to try and take the tier 1 bottom if they can. Although Lotus here, actually, they're probably not going to get it, even with the full illusion army. Yeah, Lotus just cut his way through that. In fact, Lotus could be building a... No, actually, no, it's not going to be a death, so we've already just got that finished up on Bounty Hunter. So probably going to be a BKB. Mm -hmm. Strong pickup. Currently, some counter push coming out in the mid lane, picking off all the Triants... Or, Triants fail. Uh, neutral creeps persuaded by the Chen. And uh, going to be forcing Ake to go back to the jungle and find a new army to acquire. But at least for the moment, they're just kind of buying their time, waiting for that Aegis. Roshan going to spawn in less than a minute, and that's going to be a great opportunity. Cleaning up some illusions. I'll say, Sorry. I'll just say the other, like, I'll say the other reason the puck it looks like he is going to manage to escape mid. The other reason they really, really could do with the BKB, like, right this instant on Dragonite is because PL has the Diffusal Blade done. Mm -hmm. And Dragonite, if he doesn't have any mana to cut, like, Dragonite, most of his, like, impressiveness is in that damn Dragon Tail and his spells. So if he doesn't have any mana up, he becomes a lot less useful. 
Granted, though, the Frostbeth, now that he's hit level 16, though, the Frostbeth is definitely really good, but still, he really wants to have that Dragon Tail available, because that's what makes Park Storm, even Vandalance, are super scared of him. The fact that he gets stunned for so damn long on such a low cooldown, and the instantaneous cast animation for him is like he doesn't have a cast point, it's zero. He just instantaneously pumps it out. It is incredibly powerful against these fragile, really fragile heroes. Mm -hmm. With, with that in mind, the, the defusal could certainly help them in their big engagements, but Black needs a heck of a lot more than that to pull this away. Right now, Mouseports is on the ropes, as again, they are, if they do lose this game, they are going to be taking home second place. It's not too shabby of a prize whatsoever, but obviously not what they were looking for. Either way, Alliance just showing such strength that it's almost seemed insurmountable. Uh, as far as how this translates into TI3, both very, very strong teams, and I expect a lot of them, but we are seeing some diversification of Alliance, and it's something really good for them, considering their slump from a few days back. Now, close to initiation range, Koikova gets the true vis clear vision over the trees. It's going to initiate on EGM with the Orchid, but it is a little bit of a bait, as everybody is right nearby. Track comes out on Fata, the Blinks come on through, TP, Ball Lightning coming in from Koikova. It looks like everybody's going to be able to get out of dodge effectively. And uh, back to the status quo. Fada, blink, two seconds, phase shifts for it. And he's going to get on out of there nicely. Loader actually goes for Death Slayer. No real problem having the two Death on the same team. I figured he'd just go for the BKB first, though, just because, again, it helps him out against Park, helps him out against PL. But he decides, you know, I want the offensive power here from the Death because it does give him an absolute ton of damage. The flat damage from the Death Slayer is insanely good, plus the negative armor, of course. Like, obviously you have Bounty Hunter with his own one, but it means they can just spread the negative armor out to a couple of targets now, instead. Especially if Weaver decides, you know, just to race through the middle of the lines and go for the back guys, but still I feel like the BKB, again, would help Weaver out a lot against the Puck initiator. If you can just shrug off, like Puck jumps, even if Puck gets a jump on him and he's racked in time and gets the Wanyrift down, it still lets him shrug it off. If he's gonna go in there, gonna cop a big Illuminate to the face, it picks up a bird though, and they should be able to pick off this, actually no they're not, the DPS is not high enough, they gotta wait for the creep wave to show up. Mm -hmm. Back to our production, pretty strong here, another Illuminate comes on through, EGM gonna take some hits. But uh, yeah, in general, oh, fortification, perfect time to backdoor protect it uh, all the way back up. And uh, now they're going to try to punch on through with the creep wave, of course. Driving past, S4 gets the stun out onto Vata. Can they bring him down? Yes, he's gone. Gemma True Sight on the ground. But most importantly, that potential for initiation with Waning Rift Dream Coil. He is in the grave and he does have buyback. But they're going to have to hold it for this tier 3 engagement. TP into the fight right when they need it most. Here it is. Coming on into the front lines. They can blink just about any time to turn this around. They're all clustered up. But the big thing is that Chen will still be able to Hand of God. He'll still be able to Mechanism. And that'll buy time for EGM's overgrowth. Now, Illuminate hits on nothing. Very, very unfortunate considering the cooldown. But here comes Koikova jumping on in. Isn't able to find anything with the pole just yet. There is going to be Hand of God, but he Lincolns the pole. He won't be stunned on out. And Weaver can just run rampant now. No stuns. Admiral Bulldog cleans up one. Fata is going to be cleaned up a second time over. Triple kill for Bulldog. They just destroyed them in a matter of seconds. Bulldog is going to be mecked up and barely survive. He is invis. Is the Phantom Lancer? No. Not going to be able to finish it off. Koikova, on the other hand, very, very close. Maybe not even knowing how close he was, but not finding the kill. Instead, it is going to be Alliance controlling this base effectively. They do pick up Loda. They're going to pull him back onto the tower. This should be a second kill. They do kill Loda twice over. He overstayed his welcome while everybody else was in retreat. Ake, unfortunately the same. He was possibly trying to go in for a test of fate to pull Weaver out of it. And instead, he himself takes a fall alongside him. Yeah, on the plus side, they've got the BKBs done now for the Dragonite. Weaver also has 2.1k in the bank, so if he needs, uh, they don't even need to buy back, though, obviously. They've got such good pressure from all the lanes right now. Mid just being pushed back by Trent right now. But he should have enough. Like, Weaver doesn't have too much more to farm towards that BKB. On the other hand, Dragonite's is done, and that's really, really going to make oh, things troublesome for Park for Storms, but they just can't do a damn thing against him now. And of course, the Orchid, I mean, that's the other main reason, like, Weaver really, really would like a BKB, just to help fend off the freaking Orchid from Sornsburg. As you saw, like, the Orchid on top of him that just drags him out of the tower, he was just so dead, mm -hmm. hadn't had a chance to get out of there at all. The Bounty Hunter just decides, you know, he gets his Yasha and turns his, his early Yasha, just turns it into the full-on Manta style there. Just gonna give him some nice stats, some more durability. I'm gonna say Bulldog's having one, like Bulldog has been doing extremely well, and he can open up, he's opening up with so much damage. Like Bulldog right now, we should give a shout out to him, he's sitting on 18, 1, and 6. <laughs> he's been completely decimating this game, just comes to the fact these heroes are nice and squishy for him. Like he throws down Track, Puck is so, so squishy. Track, he's uh, Corruption Orb, he just falls in just a couple of hits. He's, uh, Puck has actually been running around with a casual vitality booster, because he just needs extra durability. 
That's how rough this game's been yeah. for him. Like, when was the last time you saw Fatter be forced just to buy up a random vitality booster for raw health? Yeah, instead of an ultimate orb, I mean, just that mm. alone is a great representation of how this game has gone. And, yeah, it's just kind of shown that Alliance can play this aggressive style to a T when they find it's appropriate. They did it a little bit in China. They're showing it off right here. So, whereas Mouse Sports finds them more calm and calculated, they can pull some very aggressive tricks out of the bag. Uh, last time it was S4's uh, Storm Spirit with an amazing representation of Alliance's force. And now now it is Bulldog. Like you said, 18 kills, 6 assists, totaling 24 out of the 28 kills that Alliance has. This guy tracking at the very at, least, at the very least tracking all over the place, but trying to get as much damage in as possible as well. I just think like he's like the obvious the track kills actually don't rack up. I'm pretty sure the track kills don't rack up assists by themselves, so he's probably been involved in like pretty much all of them in terms of track gold. Because like he's been everywhere, absolutely everywhere over the map, setting up these fights. So you see Illuminate come through, they're going to do, well, not a whole lot because Aki pops the pipe and kind of laughs it off there. And there we go. High ground is being breached right now. They're looking for the Megas. Storm's going to jump forward, so they're going to Sans S4, S4 pops his BKBs. It's actually, actually you're going to die. There we go. Storm Spirit is down. Tower is almost dead as well. Overgrowth gets popped. I don't think it actually hit anybody though from what I can tell. Dream Goals get broken. Doesn't really care. As you can see, Black just get hit by a Dragon Tail as well. He's likely to fall. There we go. They clean up Black on top of that. And now Bulldog dives in. Picks off Cinderin, and this looks like Mega's coming up in a second. Bulldog doesn't even care about that, about that solar assumption. GG is called an alliance. That's three games they take, technically two, but they do have the winners brackets bench, and it's three in a best of five. They will walk away with first place prize, nine thousand dollars, and Mouse Bullets will have to sell for second place with three grand instead. Wow, what a game. Really, really strong. That last team fight was really just a, the initiation, uh, of course, of the, and the huge item advantage. They got the pipe. And once that, they could go in the high ground without sitting at 75% HP. Then they got in there, Treon Protector orchiding up the storm, locked him down. And uh, yeah, the Overgrowth, I think it only hit on the Storm Spirit as well as Phantom Lancer, and so it did get Manta styled out. But still, given they got the presence they needed to to jump on into it, and Honey Hunter cleaning things up so darn hard. I mean, with that negative armor from Desolator, with the hard right clicks from his every single item he has, will yep. provide him some physical damage. And from there, he just really really ran rampant so he either have a okay game as a bounty hunter or you have an amazing game and this was certainly an amazing one for admiral bulldog so nicely done by him and nicely done by alliance as a whole this again as you said was the second played game of this best of five but with that one point advantage they take it three zero not a single game lost in that last series just take it away and it was two zero against mouse before so have taken them four times over what do you think about that I think I think a lot of people have really been discounting Alliance into like people are like oh Alliance their drafting systems out they're just not really performing they're I feel like there's always been a strong team like there is at no point have people sort of just clicked and figured out the Alliance strategy like just denying do do stuff like just denying Bulldog is heroes doesn't really mean a whole lot because they're very flexible and sure sure Alliance um, you know they've had they've had a few odd games and recently but then again I mean, look at the look at the lead up to last year's I keep bringing this up look at TI2 look at the lead up to that Navi were having they were performing like crap the Chinese were performing like crap they were getting rolled left right and center and then who's at the end who's at the end of TI2 it's Navi in China it's the people who've been it's the teams people have been laughing at it's like holy crap they just stomped the shit out of everybody LGD didn't drop a game didn't drop a game up until that game with Navi and yet you know, two weeks before that, people were like, why the fuck did you invite the Chinese? It's pretty much like that for Alliance. Like, sure, they probably had a few, had a few bit of a slump there when they moved into their new house. Maybe they were out partying. I don't know. But still, I don't think at any point have Alliance really had any, any doubt in my mind as to whether or not they were still one of the best teams in the West. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Showing it here, and I, I think it's something that China will have to look towards when it comes down to international. This is going to be an exciting one to see because we don't just have one team to cheer for for the West. I, I really feel that there are a number of teams in the West that can take it to the top eight at the very least, and I, I'm very excited for it 100%. Uh, that should be a really, really awesome set, but not to really take away from the matches that we've seen here amazing dota the past two days uh, over the past two months these games played on out so many exciting back and forth games a lot of nail biters and uh maybe not this one here but as a whole just really really strong dota so that's what we come here to see some really really great games thank you guys so much for tuning on in i guess we can go over real quick to shout outs if you want do you have any shout outs you want to give to start things off obviously norton for sponsoring this tournament i mean guys Norton have uh, put the cash down, so thank big thanks to them. They're what made it happen this season. And actually, I want to... 
I just want to say, well, thanks to also Lauren, also for organizing this and running it. I appreciate him bringing me on again. It was a lot of fun. And I've just got to say also to the teams for providing some really great entertaining Dota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... In addition to that, of course, just thank you guys so much, viewers, for tuning on in and appreciating us either in the Twitch uh, live stream or on the Dota TV client. Uh, of course, your viewership is what makes it happen. We really, really do appreciate you guys tuning on in and hopefully enjoying the commentary as well as some awesome Dota games. So thanks for that as well. Like you said, the sponsor is really what it comes down to. Shout out to Norton and them sponsoring it up. Hopefully they can continue to do so. And uh, yeah, beyond that, that is going to be, I guess, it for us. We can go ahead and, uh, as usual, reference that we are going to be going on into the Premier League Season 6 in the future, of course, much significantly after the International, so that all dies down and the teams get their little break. But we are going to, in the proce planning process for that, if everybody's con uh, curious, it is going to be the same format is the general plans for that. So if you guys, hopefully you guys enjoyed the Cups. Otherwise, you can provide feedback. The best ways to contact and support are over on twitter.com slash the Primal League for the Premier League in general. If you guys have feedback for us as casters or uh, want to just wa wish us congratulations for the end of the season here, uh, I'm over at BlazeCasting on Twitter.com as well as YouTube and Twitch. And Triumph of Man is over at Twitter.com slash Triumph of Man. So you can catch us all there and provide some uh, feedback or congratulations. But as a whole, congratulations to Alliance because they played s uh, some amazing Dota. They played some great games with different styles each and every time. But dealing with what they were up against over and over and over, just showing why they are so considered the best in the West. And so they definitely deserve that here. That is going to be it for this tournament and this cup as a whole. Season 5 is in the books, and Alliance are the winners. Mouseports, second place. That's EG in the third, and Virtus Pro run fourth place there. So congratulations to all that were able to win prize money from that, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. It definitely was worthwhile for me, and I wish you guys the best on your either trip to Seattle or watching from home, partying up with some friends. But that's going to be it for us, and uh, we wish you the best. Blaze and Triumph signing off.